Hello, everyone, and happy weekend. Thank you for tuning in to Gemflix with us today. Gemflix is a series of online jewelry chats that we've curated with masters in the field to keep us all inspired while we are away from each other. Our special guest today is joining us from his beautiful home in New York City, which he has invited us into, Frank Everett of Sotheby's Jewelry. Frank will share some beautiful bejeweled stories from, ex from his experiences, and then comes a very fun and lively interaction in the form of 73 questions to put the full inquisition on Frank. You are all in for such a treat. A quick introduction, I'm Lynn, and along with Heidi, we founded GemX as a social club for people who love jewelry. Our members like to gather both in person and online to experience the world of jewels and gems together. Our Gemflix chats are complimentary and open to all. In lieu of event fees, we simply ask that you consider a donation to a charity during these times. We've set one up for Doctors Without Borders and that link should be popping up in your chat box. Thank you to those who've donated already, and we really appreciate your generosity at these times. Today's Gemflix is hosted in collaboration with the National Arts Club. The National Arts Club is a nonprofit organization with a mission to stimulate, foster, and promote public interest in the arts. Annually, the club offers more than 150 free programs to the public, including exhibitions, theatrical and musical performances, lectures, and readings. For more information about the club, you can visit nationalartsclub.org. Both Frank Everett and our previous Gemflix guest, Simon Teekle, will be joining us there for a live conversation when the club reopens. We hope that will be very soon. Just a few guidelines for those who are joining us on Zoom for the first time. You have access to both a chat box and a Q&A box. Please feel free to use the chat box to introduce yourselves and to chat with anyone in this conversation. We love seeing all your comments. And if you have a question for Frank, please put it into the Q&A box. We're so excited to get to the 73 questions later. And now it is my pleasure to introduce Frank Everett, described by Women's Wear Daily as the Pied Piper of New York's jewelry scene. Frank is one of the most trusted authorities in jewelry. He's responsible for driving sales transactions by leveraging opportunities to engage private clients at Sotheby's. He managed In Bloom, a selling exhibition of floral jewels from 2019, and oversaw the jewels offered in the collection of Mrs. Paul Mellon, something that we hope to hear more about today. Frank joined Sotheby's from the retail jewelry industry, where he worked with brands such as Bulgari, Tiffany's, Harry Winston and others. Prior to that, Frank spent time in the food and wine business in San Francisco, and maybe we'll get a good story out on that later too. Frank holds a degree in English literature and communications from Ursinus College and pursued graduate studies at the University of Pennsylvania. And now let me patch Frank in. Let's hope this comes through. Hello, Frank. Hi, how are you? Thank you. Uh, we're wonderful, how are you? I'm good, I'm good, thank you. Thank you so much for joining us today. My pleasure, I, I'm thrilled to be here and um, it's really great what you're doing. I think um, so many of these Zoom chats and Instagram lives and everything that's happening are so important um, at this time when we're all staying at home and um, you know, you, you have to, you have to distract yourself and focus and have a structure to the day. So I love participating in these and I love watching other people do them. I loved watching Simon's as well. So thank you for inviting me. And Frank, if we can make a request on behalf of GemX and the National Arts Club, we would love to use your gorgeous library backdrop as a virtual Zoom background for ourselves. Sure, why not? <laughs> This is really one of the most beautiful backgrounds I've seen in an interview. It's, it's funny how people are, you know, people are trying to find good places in their apartments or their houses to be on these work calls. We're all doing them. And you can always tell when somebody's like not in the mood to get it together and they just, you know, don't join video. I do it myself sometimes. Like, you know what, I'm just going to stay in bed for this call <laughs> and not go on video. 
Yes. Well, with that kind of a background, I think it's already the perfect setup for this conversation. Um, so Frank, to kick off the conversation, we we're hoping that you could share with us some of the most interesting or unique projects that you've worked on during your time at Sotheby's. Sure, I would be, I would be happy to. Um, I am, I'm so in love with my job. I'm really kind of that poster child for I love my job. And I use that hashtag often on Instagram. And it's really, uh, I mean it genuinely, authentically. I'm very, very lucky to do what I do for a living because it is what gets me out of bed. And um, I often don't feel like I'm working. So, you know, it's a luxury. I think it's easy for people to say, oh, do what you love. Yeah. Yes, that's true. But it's not always so simple to find a place uh, in the working world and a career that um, that you feel so passionate and inspired by. So I'm lucky. And that's that's what I do. Uh, yeah. The three projects that um, I want to tell you about today are three that I am so proud of, but also that I feel so lucky to have worked on. The first was uh, I had been at Sotheby's for about a year, I guess. And, um, you know, they say timing is everything. It, um, it happened in the spring, I think, of 2014, and um, it was the estate of Mrs. Paul Mellon, Bunny Mellon. And uh, it turned out just at the time that we had to go to Virginia to review the collection, a lot of the senior specialists, people that had been there longer than I, were all either on holiday or off on other appraisals. And I, they turned to me and they said, will you oversee this project? And I said, I mean, in a minute, you know, the, the, the stories of women like Bunny Mellon are what I love most about what I do. So um, it was something I never thought I would get to do. And we went to Oak Spring in Virginia um, to review the collection, a group of six jewelry specialists. And um, I really just kind of organized and, and kept the flow of property going, but we were set up there with all of our tools and, and, um, and books and, and just really did research on hundreds and hundreds of pieces of jewelry. Um, wow. It was just magnificent. I mean, her collection, was so important. And, uh, you know, we throw around words like tastemaker and influencer now. Yeah. I mean, come on, she Bunny Mellon. She was, she was it. Uh, in terms of like uh, that true understated patrician American style, she invented it. Yeah. And uh, what she did for interiors and for horticultural design in particular, she uh, really created something special. And her jewelry collection and her love of fashion and jewels was, was just an outgrowth of that. So it was unbelievable really amazing. That's incredible. And is your first slide, let's see, is this Mrs. Mellon? Yeah. So there's just a, a classic picture of Mrs. Mellon with her, her signature topiaries. Um, she surrounded herself with them and um, her garden was so special. We went there, I, I think Sotheby sent a total of about 50 specialists to her farm for weeks. Uh, because of course she collected in every category, you know, contemporary art, impressionist, American, jewelry, yeah every form of decorative art, um, silver and porcelain. So uh, it was quite a task and took, um, some of the teams were there for, for a month. We were there, I think we were there for 10 or 12 days. I can't quite remember. It was really, I, I never use this word magical. I really don't, it's just not my thing, but yeah. it was magical to be uh, on that farm every day, in the house, in the library, um, they served us beautiful lunches every day, and we got to know her staff, and we were immersed in that world for, um, for quite a while. So uh, uh, it was just a pleasure to be there. That's incredible. And on to the jewels. Um, yeah. Tell us about this so, one. Um, so this was the record-breaking record blue diamond. That's a good tongue twister, record-breaking blue diamond. Uh, <laughs> We were set up to review all of the jewels in the basement of the library. Now, I don't want you to think this was some drafty, damp basement. It was a, a beautiful finished space where many volumes of, of rare horticultural books were stored. So it's a beautiful space, but it didn't have great light. So we had our jeweler's lights and our tools, but we didn't have direct natural light. Okay. So um, when my boss, uh, Gary Schuler, who's chairman of, um, of the Americas for Sotheby's Jewelry, mm -hmm. when he saw this diamond for the first time, it was really not clear what it was. Yeah. So he said, let's go upstairs. And we all followed him upstairs into the kitchen of the library, um, which uh, had beautiful natural light. I think there was actually a skylight in there. And then we saw what it was, which was the most fabulous um, blue diamond and ended up breaking records by a long shot. It was nine, I can't remember if it was 9.75 or 9.54, I think 9.54. Um, wow. And it sold for, as you can see on there, 32 plus million dollars. 
So um, had you know broken and set a new world record for a blue diamond by a long shot. That is incredible. That blue is just so intense. So beautiful. And what I loved is it was a pair of stones, a pair of diamonds that were meant to be worn as ear pendants. And it was a it was a popular thing. In fact, Betsy Cushing Whitney had a similar pair. She had a blue and a white. Um, hers were from Bulgari. And that's what these ear pendants were. They were meant to just hang from an earring so that you would have that sort of, you know, like in the 60s, especially, <clears throat> yeah. you would do like a black pearl and a white pearl or a yellow diamond and a white diamond. So that this was a pair. The other one turned out to be a, a fancy blue diamond and sold quite well also, I think 1.5 million. Wow, wow. Yeah. And even looking at this in a basement, I'm sure you were just like, what? Uh, uh, incredible. It, was, it was every, every bit of it, every minute of that experience was like a dream. Um, also her Schlumberger jewelry, which we did not sell. She had a magnificent collection of Schlumberger jewelry. Um, they were very close friends. And uh, she was really the biggest Schlumberger client in the world. Uh, she knew uh, Jean Schlumberger even before he worked for Tiffany. And uh, she had a collection, I think about 160 fabulous pieces of Schlumberger, which she donated entirely to the Virginia Museum of Fine Art. We were privileged, we were privileged to take possession of the, of the collection and catalog it and photograph it in New York. And we had her Schlumberger jewels at Sotheby's for about a year, maybe a little over a year before the estate was settled. And then we sent everything to the um, Virginia Museum of Fine Art, where it now lives in their permanent collection. They did a beautiful exhibition. Some of those pieces have traveled. So yeah. no, Sotheby's didn't get to auction those jewels, but wow. I mean, wow. Talk, about, talk about one of a kind. And talk about a field trip to add to future Virginia uh, yes. visit. Go to that, Richmond, which... first of all, it's a beautiful museum. The VMFA is beautiful. And uh, yeah. they, I believe, have installed a permanent room for Mrs. Mellon's Schlumberger Jewels. Uh, when they did an opening of the collection, I think they had six galleries devoted to the entire collection. Now they and rotate through, I believe, and just show um, portions of it at a time in one dedicated gallery. Amazing, amazing. amazing. Um, and how about this one? Oh, the detail. I know. On that. So this is might be my favorite thing from Mrs. Mellon's collection. It's made by Verdura, um, who was also a, a friend, and both Paul and um, Bunny Mellon frequently went to visit with Verdura himself and had many pieces mm -hmm. custom made, um, lots of bespoke things that there were they were commissioning things and, and collaborating. So this, the oak leaf box made mm -hmm. in three, you know, rose, yellow, and white gold. All of these oak leaves are layered um, to form this beautiful, heavy, heavy box. And then on the top, you can see it's all colored diamonds, an oak leaf done in um, various colors of diamonds, greens and yellows and blues and, and just beautiful. I don't actually know blues. I think they're just sort of like champagne -y colors and yellows and, and greenish yellow. And then when you, the best part, when you open the lid of this beautiful, heavy gold box, inside is a little tiny diamond leaf, a small version of the one on the lid inside, just a detail for you, the owner, right? It's just like gonna sit on your nightstand or on your coffee table, wherever, and only you know about that extra little diamond leaf inside. I think it's a masterpiece. Um, it sold for a, hundred, a little over $100,000, I think, which I thought was a pretty good price. <laughs> I mean, it's such a work of art, though, as you say. I mean, it's just it's the attention to detail, and you've never seen anything quite like this. Yeah, and, you know, the oak leaf is a, is a recurring um, motif for verdura. You see it all the time. In fact, to plug my little online sale that just came online, a uh, bidding starts on yeah. Monday, there's a little pair of oak, verdura oak leaf earrings in the same color palette as this box. Um, I don't think they're diamonds. I think there's um, they're, uh, other gemstones, but they're very pretty. So the oak leaf, and then of course, Mrs. Mellon's farm, the, the farm in Virginia, yeah. Oak Spring. So uh, it was just the perfect piece uh, for, for her collection. It's stunning. Um, oh, I love it. And this, I think, launches into another story of a collection you had the honor of working with. And this photo just yeah. takes your breath away. Who is it? Isn't that stunning? So this is uh, Daphne Guinness, um, another famous style maker, designer, uh, lover of fashion. Uh, and this piece was part of the collection of Sean Lean. Uh, Sean Lean has now become a very good friend of mine. He's a jewelry designer. He worked with Alexander McQueen for 20 years, uh, creating pieces for McQueen's runway shows. So Sean is a, is a, a 
jeweler. You know, he trained as a bench jeweler and makes things in platinum and diamonds, and he's a goldsmith, I think, at, at his core. So he makes beautiful jewelry. These pieces were much more fantastical creations inspired by the vision of each McQueen show. So, you know, if you had the pleasure of seeing the Savage Beauty show at the Met, um, there was an entire room devoted to accessories from the McQueen runway shows, and most of those were made by Sean Lean. So, um, you know, fast forward 20 years after McQueen's death and after their collaboration had ended, Sean had many of these pieces, you know, at the end of each show, McQueen would say, well, it's, it's your work and you made it. And um, so he kept them. And what do you do with a collection like that? Uh, so we were so pleased to be able to uh, assist and offer them an auction. And they have ended up in some of the most important collections, fabulous pieces. This piece um, was, uh, it, it's a, a white gold and diamond glove, sort of like a falconer's glove, if if you will, and then you can see the diamond fingernails and then the beautiful birds um, in diamond also decorating this, this heavy kind of mesh chain mail glove. It's unbelievable to hold. The first time I held it in person, I just, I couldn't believe it. Um, so that's, that was uh, what we chose to put on the cover of the sale. I think there were 42 pieces in total that we sold. That's about three, it'll be three years in December um, that we had that very successful sale. And what was so exciting was when the collection came to us, it wasn't clear how we would sell it. You know, a lot of these, now this one is absolutely jewelry with fine metal and diamonds, but most of the pieces were made of aluminum or silver or, you know, different kinds of metals, but not necessarily precious materials. So were they jewelry? Were they fashion? Were they contemporary art? They were actually all three. So it really stood alone and appealed to collectors from all of those backgrounds. That's what I loved most about that sale. It's and the photo itself, Frank, I think you, and that you chose to take it in black and white. There's something so timeless yeah. about this and it really showcases well, this piece. This was, a, this, was, this was a photo, actually, like many of the photos in the book, it came, we didn't take that picture on the cover. Um, I believe that's an image by the fashion photographer, Nick Knight, um, uh -huh. who was a friend of Sean's. And uh, one of the reasons that catalog, I'm so proud of it, it is so beautiful just as a keepsake, is because um, Sean Lean had such wonderful connections with all of these great fashion photographers uh, yeah. that he had worked with, and they all gave him use of image for the book. And we often don't have so many great photographs. So when you look through that book, you see wonderful work like this. And well, we have great photographers at Sotheby's, but we did not take that picture. Not that. Well, that's credit where credit is due. Um, let's see some more. Is this also Sean Lane? Yeah, that's just a picture of Sean with Lee McQueen, his dear friend. And um, again, you know, they were students at school together and worked together for many, many years on so many projects. And McQueen, as I said, was known for these themed, very theatrical shows, very... Uh, focused and full of meaning. So the work that Sean did um, to complement each collection that, that Alexander McQueen was making was really, um, it really was art. It really was a work, each one was a work of art and we were so happy to, to sell them. So wonderful. Yeah, it's, I'll never, never forget it. The exhibition was beautiful, the catalog was beautiful and Sean is just the most wonderful person. Um, this piece, the, the coil neck piece, is um, I, I chose this one to show of all the pieces from the collection because it's, uh, it had such a life. It, I think was in three different McQueen runway shows as well as being worn by Bjork on an album cover. And um, it had several incarnations and then I think it was first made in brass if I'm not mistaken. And then maybe in aluminum, I'm not sure what the other metal was. And then there were extra rows added to it at one point. So it had a, a, a rich life between Sean and McQueen. They used it again and again. And um, it's just a magnificent piece. And it, that it, it, it really, I think, um, borders this, what is jewelry? Is this armor? I mean, it's so powerful to, to see. Obviously inspired by African tribal jewelry and then worked into um, beautiful, beautiful McQueen fashion shows. I mean, really, it was just worn so beautifully. Um, again, if you see the catalog, you'll see all four images yeah. from all the different um, ways that they used it. So it's just a pretty fabulous piece. It really is. And we're seeing a great comment in the chat come through of um, the fact that Sean Lane used precious and both non-precious materials to make high jewelry and how he elevated all these materials to such a um, higher form. 
and I mean, if you remember the earrings that Sean made for the Floral Jewel Show for In Bloom, I, I mean, they were incredible with the green diamond and the white diamond and all the beautiful enamel work that he did. Um, you can't get higher jewelry than that. So he really is an artist. Really, and, and I think like changes the jewelry landscape really helps to redefine it. Yeah, in fact, I can't remember who said that that's, it was, it was, one, it was like either, um, the FT or Women's Wear Daily, somebody referred to that sale as a watershed moment for artists' jewelry. That was one of the proudest quotes I've ever read about our work in the jewelry department, is to say that that was a watershed moment for artists' jewelry. So it really, it yeah. um, confirmed what we had suspected about his work. Yeah. It's, it was everything. It was art, it was jewelry, it was fashion, and, and it stood alone. Yes, amazing. Oh, I'm moving on a slightly different aesthetic from Sean, but tell us more about, this is so timely, Frank, as we enter into spring from our isolation, but I think this is so uplifting to see right now. Well, you know, when we did this show last May, it's almost a year ago that we did it, um, our hashtag at the time that we all kept using was, you know, florals for spring, groundbreaking, as we all know of that famous line from Devil Wears Prada. Uh, was it groundbreaking in the month of May to do an exhibition of floral jewels? Not at all. But was it beautiful and well-received? It was. Um, this goes back again to Sean because I was in London. Um, I was hosting a lunch uh, to kick off this sale for Sean Lean. And I was, I was so privileged to be seated next to my friend Carol Wolfen, who um, is a jewelry editor at British Vogue. So Carol and I met at that lunch and we hit it off immediately. Uh, we had such a nice time. She's such a lovely person. And uh, when I got back to my office in New York, she had sent me a copy of her beautiful book, Floral Jewels. So I love flowers. I love floral jewels. I just think it's one of the most beautiful, pure, natural forms. It just screams to be made into jewelry. You know, you see flowers in nature and you automatically, if you're a jewelry person you think wow you could create that look with these stones and you could make it this size and flowers just naturally go to jewelry so carol and i it didn't take us long we just said we should do something let's do a selling exhibition and we put together um, a beautiful group of about 50 jewels i worked on the vintage pieces she worked on some of the contemporary designers and uh, it just ended up being a beautiful beautiful exhibition that we did last may at sotheby's this must just be the most beautiful catalog too. We're seeing a lot of comments in the chat saying they want to frame this, they want the book, and I, it's so visually compelling. Well, these were made, um, our marketing team, you know, said that they were gonna do a photo shoot of the floral jewels. And I wasn't, I didn't know so much what the concept was gonna be until the day of their shoot. And then when I walked in, when they were creating these beautiful still life with the, with the gorgeous fabric and then, you know, pinning the actual little insects and butterflies and that kind of a thing and creating these gorgeous tableau, I was blown away. I mean, it's one of the most beautiful things that they've created for jewelry ever. And um, we actually turned them into a set of postcards, I think. They did about eight or 10 um, yeah. pictures like that incorporating. And I love that they incorporated old and new together. You know, we're always um, trying to position vintage things with contemporary pieces. And I think they just did a beautiful job of that. And the contemporary jewels did very, very well. You know, I don't see a lot of contemporary jewelry in my auctions because right. those jewels are still being enjoyed. People are still, you know, they've been recently bought and so they're still being enjoyed. But we love contemporary jewelry and it was a pleasure to include them. And many of those pieces sold. We did very well with the, um, the contemporary jewels. That's incredible. Let's see some more. Is this one of the contemporary pieces? Yeah, these are incredible earrings by Cindy Chow. Um, truly, the, she is an artist. And this pair of, um, of flower earrings, all done in sabarites with white diamonds as well, were sold. The, the, I think the catalog went online, and I think they were sold in about 20 minutes. And um, I probably could have sold three more pairs of them. And people were buying them. The person that bought them bought them from the picture. They are so special. There's so much dimension. Uh, in, in the flower. I wish you could see it and the way it sat on the ear and each flower is unique. I just think Cindy Chow's um, a wonderful designer and it was amazing to me that they sold that quickly. They're incredible. And the, the Savorites are the green stones, right? The bull. Yeah, the bull. they're so sparkly. You know, they have um, a, a similar color to emerald, but yeah. uh, they have a higher, you know, a higher refractive index. And so they, uh, they just sparkle more and they're just beautiful. 
stunning. Oh, I think we are on to a section, Frank. I, so one question that we had a lot um, come up in the registration questions is what are some of the most memorable jewels that you've handled? And I think this one might be a lead in for that part of the conversation. It sure is. This is the, um, the magnificent necklace by Van Cleef and Arpels made in 1949 for Queen Nosley of Egypt. Um, and it's spectacular. It was for the wedding of her daughter. And uh, it's, it's, I'll never forget it. The, the, just holding that necklace in my hands, the heft, uh, the size of the diamonds, you can see any one of those round diamonds would make a spectacular ring. And there are many of them. Yeah. Uh, I just have never seen anything quite like it. It's a, a, a true bib and uh, just it, it has it has so much um, what I call just sort of heft. It's the only thing I can think of visually mm -hmm. and physically when you hold it. It felt like fabric the way the diamonds were put together and on it just, you know, conformed right over the, the clavicle and really looked beautiful on everybody that wore it. And believe me, many, many people in the department wore it. I'm kind of sorry I didn't try it on. I was going to ask, Frank, this would be the bib that you try on if you had to. I don't think it would have fit, to be honest with you, because when I think <laughs> back about all the women that tried it on, it fit very close to the neck. I think the inner circumference was probably like 13 and a half or maybe 14 inches. So I actually don't know that it would have fit, but uh, yeah, I, I, I certainly held it in my hands often enough. We, we had the, um, the necklace for a long time before it came to auction. And then of course, what was so exciting to find out after the auction, um, I didn't know until many, many months later. Uh, mm -hmm. One second, let me just, um, I'm getting a call. <laughs> Sorry about that, I'm on my phone, so I was getting, um, I'm back. Uh, so um, many months later, we found out that Van Cleef and Arpels had bought the piece for their their collection for their archive. So uh, it was unveiled about a year later at an exhibition in London. And yeah. when I saw that picture, I was like, yes! You know, mm -hmm. to think of such a special piece going back uh, to their permanent collection is pretty fabulous. It's extraordinary. Um, did you get to see it in person? Did you ever see it in person, that necklace? I did. I did not get to try it on, unfortunately. I um, really regret that. And we're getting a great question in the chat box from Juliet. She was wondering if the tiara goes with this necklace and if it's also by Van Cleef. It, it is, the, the tiara and the earrings, all of that entire suite that you see on her was made for the wedding yeah. um, by Van Cleef and Arpels. I do not know the whereabouts of the tiara or the earrings. Stunning together. I mean, they almost look like mirrored silhouettes um, on it's, her in this and, and the earrings, I mean, to see it all together, it's like she can practically, you know, she almost can't hold her head up. But, you know, the, <laughs> earrings, the earrings are like the size of my hand. I mean, they're just, you know, it's just, a, a, it's a staggering collection of diamonds that she's got on all at once. And I'm privileged just to have held the necklace. It's breathtaking. It's breathtaking. Um, is there another jewel that really, I think, has captivated you and sort of is worth, it's hard to believe anything really comes to this level, but we would love to hear more. Well, it's, I never, I, I can't pick favorites because there are so many things yeah. I love and it doesn't always have to be um, the, like the, the highest value piece. Yeah. Um, one jewel that I didn't send you a picture of that I should have is a famous bracelet that was from the collection of Marlena Dietrich. Okay. And um, it's a, a 1940s bracelet by Cartier, heavy, gold links in rose and yellow gold, and then just a big barrel of lapis for a clasp. Oh, yeah. So it's just that lapis and gold. Um, we sold it several years ago. It sold very well. I think it sold for about 160,000 um, all in, but that, I'll never forget that jewel. It was just such a, such a great story um, yeah. from Dietrich's collection. It had been gifted to her by the author, um, Eric Maria Remark, who she yeah. knew very well and helped during the war. Yeah. And uh, it was just, a, a, so piece, I can't pick a favorite. Um, the Queen Nosley necklace, of course. The next slide that, that I included is just a, a great piece of design, in my opinion. This is a 1970s necklace by Bulgari. Wow. Um, you can see that huge carved emerald um, on the bottom of the sotoir. But if you look closely at the chain, there's every stone imaginable, not just rubies, emeralds, and sapphires, but also citrines and aquamarines and lots of what we call semi-precious stones. So it's a complete mix, every color of the rainbow in that necklace. And that's another one that ended up going back to the um, archival collection. So Bulgari bought that back to their permanent collection and it went for just over a million dollars in Geneva. 
um, last year. So that's just, a, to me, an unforgettable jewel in every way. Uh, the, the history, the story, the look, the color, and then the, the where, you know, the end result that it went back to um, a museum collection. I love that. It's incredible. And that it's really just on a simple black dress. I mean, it is the statement jewel. Isn't it fabulous? It's incredible. Um, and I think we have one more that you've picked out to highlight for us. So this is sort of the, you know, an example of the ultimate provenance. Um, and, you know, that is kind of my, my favorite part, um, the story of the jewel. And when I first heard about this collection through my colleagues in Geneva, I just didn't even believe that it existed. Huh. Um, there were one, about 100 pieces in the Bourbon Parma family um, yeah. that had been there for centuries. And I think five of those pieces were attributed directly back to the personal collection of Marie Antoinette. So um, I, I didn't, just hearing the story got me excited. I never imagined that I would be able to get to hold these jewels, be in the auction room when they were sold. And of course, this is the top lot from that entire sale, the magnificent natural pearl pendant on that little diamond bow. Uh, there, I believe there's a painting of her wearing this piece, okay. and um, it sold. Uh, it sold for thirty six million. That's incredible, Frank. Just for a sense of scale, how big was this? It well, was it's um, it, you know, I, it's it's probably two, three, two and a half to three inches from top to bottom. Yeah. Um, very similar in size to the famous La Peregrina uh, yeah. pearl. Uh, from Elizabeth Taylor's collection, yeah. uh, and just a beautiful quality, beautiful luster, and just a, an amazing, a, an amazing object. Um, let alone an amazing jewel with an amazing provenance. Just the you know the size of this natural pearl is just astounding. So it really ticks. It just kind of ticks every box, and more. And more. Yeah. yeah. And I, I think we could really do a whole lecture series on these amazing oh. pearls, as we've heard, and that it, back then, and this is a natural pearl, of course, yeah. it just captured yeah. the imagination so much, and, and today it's so timeless. Yeah, I think the natural pearls, when they come as part of like a really storied collection, are, are always very alluring, whether it was the La Peregrina from Elizabeth Taylor, or um, the beautiful pearls from the Duchess of Windsor. Um, yeah. that, that were sold in the 80s and then were in the collection of Kelly Klein for years and then she sold them. Uh, it's uh, those natural pearls, there's something special even amongst all the gemstones. There's yeah. something extra alluring, I think, about the, the storied natural pearls. There really is. And it, like the shape is so organic and so fluid and feminine and soft. Um, all yep. the, the, the total package as you yep. so eloquently. Yep. Um, and I think that is the end of your slide. It is. And we're so excited. I see you getting ready, Frank. I'm There's getting ready. It's about to be a marathon interview coming up to dive a little deeper. All of these are just such wonderful <laughs> anecdotes. And I think you've given us so many sparkly pick me ups to think about already today. That's um, what I want to do. I want to get, I, I just, I really feel strongly about sharing what I, that's why I'm, you know, on Instagram. I, I try to keep as many things posted as I can because when I was working in the retail world, as much as I enjoyed my retail career, you're really focused on one brand, one line, and it's not vintage pieces. So before I worked at Sotheby's, I never dreamed of handling this kind of property. I really didn't. I mean, I saw it in books. I could see it at a museum show, but to work with it, handle it, have it on my desk, that Queen Nosley necklace was on my desk for months. Every morning I'd bring it out of the vault and just have it there on a tray or on a neck form. So I feel a responsibility to share that with people because I am so fortunate to see these treasures that come and go and they go into a private collection and they're, you're not gonna see them again. No, it's so true. And I think it's a slice of history too, as yeah. you're saying. You're Precisely. Historian, but like the contemporary jewels you've highlighted, they're just so reflective of their time. And yeah. you really are so lucky that you have the opportunity to encounter so many of these. Um, and Frank, if you are ready, we ready. Have, I mean, literally I my hope, I don't know. Actually, I don't know if I'm ready or not. I had it on silent as we were chatting, but um, it's been dinging. The, the chat room okay. has been coming to life and if you are ready we are um we have a great set of questions for okay. you okay um are you ready to get started yeah okay great frank can you tell us how you started your day this morning 
I started my day, I actually did a, uh, like a Zoom workout with my trainer, um, which I've been doing twice a week. And uh, I'm so happy to be doing it. Uh, he's a great guy. And um, I, I was working out from the beginning of the quarantine, but I only started about two weeks ago with him because I was like, do I really want to do this on FaceTime? It's like, but it's been fantastic. It really, it's like being at the gym. So that's how I started. That's amazing. What did the workout consist of? Oh, all kinds of stuff. Using resistance bands mostly. Um, so he puts me through my paces and uh, it's really, it was great. Frank, what did you have for breakfast this morning? I don't eat breakfast. Oh, do you drink coffee or tea? Black coffee and I haven't had anything to eat. I usually don't eat until um, like two in the afternoon. Okay. Um, is there a TV series you're currently binge watching? Uh, there's usually a, a, a bunch. I'll tell you what, I just <laughs> finished uh, one called Freud, um, which turned out to have absolutely nothing to do with Sigmund Freud, although yeah. he is a character in it. Yeah. So I finished that. Uh, and then I'm really excited. We, we just broke down and bought the, the Hulu so that I could watch um, Mrs. America with Kate Blanchett. I love that. Playing. So that's, that's next, and I might, I might start it tonight. Um, so I've been watching that one. And then the other one we're midway through is called World on Fire with Helen Hunt. And it's a, um, you know, sort of pre-World War II, 1930s drama, and it's beautifully filmed. And um, that's, that's an era that I'm very interested in. Also yeah. watching Babylon Berlin, uh, about halfway through the most recent season of that. If you know, it's a fantastic series. Also, um, you know, set just before the beginnings of World War II. Awesome. We'll have to add those to my list. Um, yeah. Frank, what is the best movie of all time? Funny Girl. Considering jewelry, what is the best movie of all time? Funny Girl. <laughs> Love it. Um, do you have a favorite actor or an actress, Frank? I don't have a favorite. Um, I, I, I love so many different performers. I read that, that I don't think I could pick a favorite. If I had to pick a favorite jewelry performance, um, I won't say Funny Girl, even though I could, because that last scene, the Art Deco earrings that Barbara Streisand wears in the last scene are like, a, they're like a supporting character in that scene, yeah. right? Yeah. Like if, when I'm she's sure. singing, if she weren't wearing the earrings, there would be some drama missing. Yes. But, um, Jewelry wise, I, I really still love all that Chanel jewelry in the Kira Knightley version of, um, uh, oh, what was it? I can't remember what the film was now, where she wore all the Chanel jewelry. Anyway, I can't remember. Um, and let's see, oh, there's some comments coming on in the chat. Maybe someone will, was it Anna Karenna? Yes, of course. There it is. I knew our chat box would come through. Thank you, guys. Not my favorite film, but just the, the way that jewelry was shown and worn in the film was, I thought, was beautiful. Amazing. Frank, if you could style someone for next year's Oscars, who would it be? Oh, who would it be? Um, I always think that... Uh, that Amy Adams wears jewelry beautifully. She's worn a lot of vintage Cartier. She's, um, she's, she's shown up on the red carpet with, with vintage. So I would probably say either Amy Adams or Nicole Kidman, who wears so much Fred Layton and really has worn lots of 19th century jewelry on the, on the red carpet. So I'd probably choose one of those two. And what clothing and jewelry would you have Amy Adams wear? Vintage. Anything? I would just anything vintage, you know, call my friend Cameron Silver at Decades and, uh, and find something there. I mean, if I were styling, if I had the privilege to style somebody like that for the red carpet, I would definitely go vintage all the way. Love it. Um, what is one piece of jewelry that everyone, man or woman, should own? A brooch. Oh, and Frank, can you tell us about that one you're pointing to? Yes. I. I finally broke down and bought a brooch for myself because, you know, I'm spoiled and I have so many at my disposal every season. I kind of never have to wear the same brooch twice. Yeah. But at some point, I thought this is crazy that I'm encouraging everybody to buy them and I didn't have one. So um, last year I was in London um, for Masterpiece London, a wonderful show that sadly will not be happening this year, but hopefully next year we'll get to go back. Mm -hmm. And um, on the weekend, I was just shopping around Portobello Road and I saw this little Victorian star. It's a very typical design you see them often but i just thought that's a perfect thing for me to just have and wear on my lapel so and it really pops um the shape i love it 
It's beautiful. Um, Frank, where did you grow up? Uh, I grew up in Pennsylvania, uh, about two hours outside of New York City, mm -hmm. on a farm, actually. Oh, did you have a favorite subject in school? Oh, yeah, English, English literature, uh, novels and, and theater in particular. I love um, plays, so in literature. Um, and what was your most likely superlative in high school? Oh, probably um, act, like class actor. Class actor. Or biggest, biggest ham. <laughs> Frank, if you had to teach a course in university, what would you call it? Oh, um, great ladies of the day. Oh, love it. Love that. Maybe we'll do that as an e-course. I um, love it. If you had to take your jewelry students on a field trip, where would we go irrelevant of distance? Where would we go? Paris, I guess, Place Vendôme. Yeah. I, do, I think, yeah, if, if you know, money's no object, that's yeah. where you're gonna get the full immersion and understanding of, yes. uh, of, the, great, of the greatness of high jewelry. Of course, of course. Um, is there any advice you would give to yourself at a younger age? Um, sleep more. <laughs> Love that. Um, where do you feel most inspired of spot? Museums, I think. I mean, we're pretty, uh, we're pretty fortunate in New York City and uh, we've lived here now, my husband and I, seven years and we take full advantage. You know, we go to the Met regularly. Yeah. We go to all, you know, the Noya Gallery. I, I don't know, we might go to the Noya like once every two months, it seems. I um, so I think that's, oh, I'm getting another call, so I gotta. Are you back? Yeah. Um, so I think I would probably say museums and I'm, I'm very inspired by um, artwork outside of jewelry. So I think it's important um, when you spend so much time in the jewelry world to look at everything else. I am particularly like, you know, 19th century painting um, yeah. is a passion of mine. Uh, furniture and decorative arts, mm -hmm. obviously, you know, and when you look behind me and you see these books, they're not all jewelry, right? Yeah. There's fashion, photography, interiors, art, um, and Part of the book thing is I have a hard time going to any museum show and not buying the book. <laughs> of course, um, it's it's only the weight that's the factor. I'm like, oh, do I want to carry this yeah. home? Exactly. Um, do you have a favorite gallery inside the Met or a favorite room? Mm, I guess the Costume Institute. I just yeah. love to go. You know, I, th they're not the greatest rooms necessarily, but I've had some of the greatest times. Even when I go to a show that I might not be that excited about you know when camp when camp opened i was kind of like oh i don't even really understand what this means and then when i got there and i just read the introductory wall text and the you know the susan sontag quote and i said okay i get it let's get in here and then it turned out to be a fabulous show um so i think probably that's the, the most inspiring thing to me perfect frank what's the best vacation you've ever taken oh that's a tough one the best vacation i'm gonna say um, Morocco. I, my, my, we, we went on a three-week trip to Morocco for my 50th birthday. I will not tell you, I will not tell you how long ago that was. And, um, <laughs> it was special because we went with friends and we also did uh, a lot of cooking classes. It was kind of a culinary thing. Yeah. And so we were in the Atlas Mountains for a while. We were by the seaside in Essoaria. We were in Marrakesh and we just kept doing cooking classes and then exploring these different areas. So I would say uh, that because it was a complete immersion. And I think that's, those are the best trips when you go for, to one place for kind of a long time. Yeah, three weeks. I mean, yeah. it just sounds like a dream right now. Luxury, that, it, was, it was amazing. So on that note, is there someone, somewhere you've always dreamed of traveling to, but haven't quite gotten to yet? Uh, yes, uh, I would say probably Southeast Asia is the top of my list. And we had a trip planned a few years ago down to some pretty fine points in terms of Cambodia, Vietnam, and um, and Thailand, and then we had to cancel at the last minute, and we just have not gotten back to doing it because it's a lot. It's a lot of time again, and yeah. time is the ultimate luxury. I mean, yes. when we talk about luxury, really, it's time. And yeah. so I we had it planned, and it's just been very hard to get back to. to so that's probably top of my list. That's great. And what is the most adventurous thing uh, you've done in your life? adventurous thing. I think the most adventurous thing was probably moving to San Francisco um, 
pretty much like on the spur of the moment. Like yeah. I think, you know, I was, I was in graduate school at the time at Penn and I just decided it wasn't really what I wanted to pursue. I decided is academia the thing I want to do and really be a professor. Yeah. And I just loaded up the car and drove to San Francisco. I had a friend living there at the time yeah. and um, slept on her couch until yeah. I could find a job and an apartment. And when I think back, I don't know how I did that. I don't even, I, I think I had, you know, $200 or something. Wow. Oh, wow. It was I mean, the 80s. It was the 80s. It was a different time. <laughs> and I guess if you had a superpower, what would it be, Frank? Oh, I don't know. A superpower. Um, uh, I can't think of one. I don't know, actually. <laughs> I mean, we can come back to it, or it could be, I'll give you a few options. How's that? I mean, something, something that I wish I could do, I wish I could make clothes, actually. Oh, that's I find that nice. very, like, uh, or, or make something. Like, I'm not very, um, I'm not very crafty or good with my hands, and I'm very yeah. envious of people that, that, can, that can make things. You yeah. know, I'm, I'm not a gardener. I'm not, I mean, I do cook. That's the one thing that I do do. I do love to cook, but I would like to be able to, to, to make something. That's a great answer. Um, on that, someone is asking, oh, Frank, have you ever tried to make your own jewelry? Never. <laughs> no, I, I, not, even, not even a thought. And the few times that I've thought about, like, oh, I could, like, design my own line. I could, I could come up with, I just, the, only, the things that I design are just, like, direct copies of everything in these books that I've seen. Yeah. <laughs> so it's, I, I'm too inspired by the great houses to even think past that. So, no, I do not have inclinations for that. Oh. Um, from Maria in our chat room, what do you enjoy most about living in New York City? Uh, well, I do love walking to work. I think mm -hmm. for me, to be able to work at, at a place like Sotheby's and to walk there, my dad always told me that if you can walk to work, you, you really improve your life in, in many ways. And he was absolutely right. So in most cities that I've lived in, I either can walk to work or at least a very short drive. Even when I lived in Los Angeles, it was a very short drive from yeah. where we lived to Rodeo Drive. So um, I think that it might be it might be that uh, you know, and then the proximity to everything you know that you can just get to so many things so quickly. But that walking to work thing is very important to me. That's a great answer, um, Frank. It's Friday or Saturday night happy hour. Where would Frank be found in New York City under normal circumstances? Ooh, okay, so let me think. Um, if I could go anywhere right now for a drink mm -hmm. at six o'clock, yeah. I would go to that little chapel bar at the new photography museum. Oh, um, yes. Um, is, Veronica? Well, Veronica is the restaurant, which I also went to right before it closed, yeah. um, which was fantastic. But no, there's a little cocktail bar called oh. the Chapel Bar. Oh. And it's almost like a little secret thing. You have to know where the door is. And then they, they let a certain number of people in at a time. And it is just, it's very small and very beautiful. So if I could go anywhere, I think that's where I'd go. That sounds delightful. Um, and Frank, from someone in the audience, what would you be drinking at the bar? Oh, just uh, French white wine. It's about the only thing I drink. <laughs> Oh, Frank, my phone's blowing up, but I would love to answer this call. Yes! Wait one second. Hello. Vivian. Hi, Frank. It's Vivian. How are you? I saw your face. You're planning the ultimate ladies who lunch event. You can invite four guests, dead or alive. Who would you invite? Oh, my God. Okay. Yes. Four ladies? Four ladies? Four. Okay. Yeah. So I'm going to choose Daisy Fellows first of all, because she was the great style icon and had all the, the, the most fabulous jewels, but also there are so many scandalous stories about how awful she was. So I would love, I would love to like see her in action. She was like constantly stirring the pot and sleeping with everybody else's husbands. And I mean, the stories are legendary. So I'd invite her. I'd also invite Elsie DeWolf because I think Elsie DeWolf, um, the, the sort of the first named interior designer, uh, knew everybody's secrets. I think she was the great like party orchestrator and knew everything about everyone. So I think I'd invite Daisy, I'd invite Elsie DeWolf. Um, I would invite uh, uh, Mrs. Reitzman because I think she was probably the loveliest of all from what I've heard. I never had the pleasure of meeting her. And um, I would invite her also because I just 
missed the beautiful sale of her jewels when I came to Sotheby's. It had been about six months before. And um, colleagues still to this day will say, well, remember when we did Reitzman and when I say I wasn't there, they're like, really? How is it possible you weren't here for Mrs. Reitzman's sale? So I would have to invite her. And then let's see, we have to throw in, um, uh, you know who else I would invite um, is Nina Griscom, who just passed away. And she was uh, somebody I think I would really have liked because again, when I read all the accounts of her, she was just a really fun loving society gal um, through the eighties, especially. And um, she modeled and she was a TV presenter and she was just supposed to be just a really, really fun person and had been very close friends with Bill Blass. So she worked with him. So I think that would be a nice, a nice foursome. Did you catch all that Vivian? Yes, love it. Thank you. Love it. And you, Vivian, love you can it. come. <laughs> and you, Vivian, he added. You should oh, be there you. as well. Um, and to tag on to that question, Frank, what would you serve at lunch to these lovely women? Oh, they first of all, they wouldn't care. Um, it would be the, the lightest of, of the light. I've learned yeah. through my through my years of doing lunch after lunch after lunch, the lighter the better. Um, mm -hmm. No soup no red sauce uh and just keep it really simple i mean like a, a simple little green salad um with a champagne vinaigrette and maybe some poached salmon and some steamed vegetables and then a little sorbet for dessert i just think it's the keep it simple and classic yeah um from tom Heyman in our audience what is ah. your favorite spot in new york city to go to for lunch for lunch well i do love Cafe Sabarsky at the um, at the Neue Gallery. I have to tell you, that's Great. that's probably one of my like. It, we're so jaded um, in New York, and doing what we do for a living, being able to go to so many fabulous meals. Right? I mean, not only do I take clients to lunches and dinners, but then we host things at Sotheby's, and then when we go to Geneva for the, I mean, we're very very. It's a beautiful world and a beautiful luxurious world that we're allowed to uh, tiptoe into. So we get a little bit jaded. But something about lunch at Cafe Sabarsky like still gets me excited. The idea of going there and to sit in that beautiful room, I, I, I just, I find it something I really look forward to. Yes. Frank, what is one fashion trend that you wish could last forever without going out of fashion? Um, I think the, a look that I, th that I find completely timeless is, uh, I'm, I'm trying to think of who, sports the look so well sort of like imagine like Ali McGraw with with hair just like parted and completely slicked back and yeah. then a massive earring yeah that to me is just like a look that I never ever get tired of and when I see it in editorial in Vogue or Bizarre it's just like that is it, it's just it's so much about a woman's face mm -hmm. pulling the hair back and then framing it with some fabulous big big earring I think that that comes to mind so chic. Frank, what is one trend, fashion or not, that you wish were over already? Uh, men not wearing socks with suits and business shoes. Mm. You know, that it, I, I think I just saw it. I thought it was gone. I mean, I really thought it was gone. And I think I just saw somewhere, somebody either in a, in a magazine or on TV or something, wearing like a full on business suit with a tie and a big hard, like an Alden shoe. And yeah. then... And then like a bare, hairy ankle? No, thank you. Yeah, no, thank you. Um, <laughs> Frank, do you have any other pet peeves? Oh my God, how, how much time do you have? <laughs> <laughs> Maybe just a couple. <laughs> um, I think one of them is in, impatience, and I can sometimes exhibit impatience, so it's something that I always try to to watch in others and remind myself. It was something that was very important in my family. Mm -hmm. um, my father had a lot of patience and I was, I, I think it's a very, very important thing to have. Mm -hmm. And as I get older and busier and certainly moving to New York doesn't help it. I Definitely. think I, I lose patience easier than I did in my youth. And I, I, I try to keep myself in check. So maybe I, I see that in others and I don't like seeing it and I don't like seeing it in myself. Yeah. Do you have a guilty pleasure, Frank, or something you can't say no to, even though you know it's bad? Yeah, I mean, food. The, the, food. the worst thing for food are, you know, sprinkles, cupcakes, uh -huh. and, um, and cake in general. Like, I really just love cake, like a big birthday cake with frosting, and I could get one every week of the year. I so, did um, see your post that sprinkles delivers. Oh, like, so dangerous. Well, 
in this apartment, we're kind of taking it to the limit in terms of trying to support the businesses that we want to stick around. So we keep ordering things and it, it is important. You know, if you've got anybody out there that you, that you love, yeah. if it's a restaurant, if they're still open right now and sending food, yeah. you just have to do it. And then, you know, you deal yeah. with it when it arrives, you throw away the outer packaging, you wash your hands, you pop it in the oven. And yeah. we're trying to support as much as we can. And the cupcakes were that kind of a thing. I mean, I'll, I'll just be devastated if sprinkles isn't here when we, when we get back to the new normal. So sprinkles cupcakes would be it. Love that. Um, and Frank, what is the hardest part about your job? The hardest part, um, what would be the hardest part? I think because the, the business is seasonal, you know, we, it's almost like an academic calendar. The, I wish sometimes the work could be spread out through the year a little bit. Like we do get pretty quiet around the holidays, which is lovely. You know, yeah. after my many, many years in both restaurants and then retail, mm -hmm. for me, Christmas was one day, right? Yeah. So I would work Christmas Eve always. I'd have Christmas Day off. And then the day after Christmas, you're back at it. So the seven years that I've been at Sotheby's, it's a luxury again to, to be able to have, we have two weeks off at Christmas. We actually have a shutdown. Yeah. Um, because there are no options going on. But um, the this, this summertime too, I think you'll see maybe more of a spreading out of, of auctions um, throughout the summer because that's the hardest part for me. It all happens in the spring yeah. and then it all happens in the fall. And when I'm working on my jewelry auctions, it's the same time that clients might want to talk to me about bidding on something in another sale, right? So mm -hmm. if I work closely with a client, they might ask me about something in a decorative arts sale. We've yeah. got a beautiful sale. We've got a beautiful sale online right now called Style, and it's all decorative arts, silver, porcelain, beautiful things, tabletop. And um, I work with clients on pieces like that as well, and advising them. So I think that's it. I would just try to spread the work out. Um, and Frank, what is the best part about your job? Uh, making making the matches, being a matchmaker. My friend Cameron Silver uh, asked me last week, I did a call with him and he called me a matchmaker. And that really is what I do because as soon as I see a jewel, I think about where it belongs. And um, it really is less about selling the jewel than helping it find its way into the right collection or helping the client find something that they are really gonna love that's either gonna be um, a, a key part of their collection and fill a niche or just be something that they're gonna love wearing. Is it for an occasion? Is it gonna match a dress? Whatever, does it remind them of something that their grandmother had? Whatever it is, I like making the matches. From Anonymous in our question chain, how do I get a job working with you at Sotheby's? <laughs> well, Sotheby's is, you know, it's a pretty competitive place. If I had known how competitive it was when I went through the interview process, I probably would have been a lot more nervous um, I did come up to New York kind of a little bit in a naive way. And I said, well, this sounds like a great opportunity. I'll go talk to Sotheby's. But uh, it's very competitive and you have to have, um, you have, to have tenacity and, and patience. But we do have great programs that you can investigate online, both internship programs and trainee programs. Mm -hmm. And uh, th there's a, a process that you go through. But if you go online, you can find both of those programs described and you can apply that way. And then people find their way into the appropriate um, specialist category after they, they enter the program. That's a great answer. And you're over halfway, Frank, just so you know, we got the Ooh. counter going. So we're really? gonna speed things up a bit. Um, that was 35 questions? Yes. Um, who are you self-isolating with right now? My husband of 20 years and uh, our little dog of 14 and a half years, Leo. My husband, Alex, and my dog, Leo. Love it. How did you pick the name Leo? I'm a Leo. I'm born in July. That was our Actually, next question. Yeah, and we couldn't think of anything else. My husband never really liked the name, but it's stuck. You know, sometimes you just have a name and you can't come up with something, so it works. Yes. And what kind of a dog is Leo? He is a Maltese. Hmm. Do you read horoscopes in the magazines, Frank? Never. Never. If you had to grab three magazines before running onto a flight, what would you grab? Oh, Vanity Fair. Yeah. Uh, in style, because I think that's just a good thing to read on a plane. Mm -hmm. And probably town and country, because there's always so much jewelry in there. There's always so much jewelry. It's such a good yeah. read. Um, do you have a favorite type of gemstone, Frank? My favorite stone, really, I actually can say it's a favorite, is aquamarine, because I just love that color so much. 
Yeah. And I like all the blue gemstones, but aquamarine, there's just something when there is a beautiful crystal, a beautiful emerald cut aqua, it's just the most pleasing thing to my eye. I love it. That's beautiful. What's the largest aquamarine you've ever handled, carrot size? I feel like we had one that was about 100 carats, and I'm trying to remember the jewel where I saw it. I do remember, actually, it was at Carbon French. They showed it to me. They had a necklace with a big aquamarine. Oh, I think it was about 100 carats. It was beautiful. Sounds amazing. Um, Art Nouveau or Art Deco? Art Deco. Frank Sinatra or Elvis Presley? Sinatra. Diamonds or pearls? Whoa, so it depends on the diamond or the pearl, but I'll say diamonds. Diamonds. Do you have a favorite period in jewelry? It changes. Um, it changes from time to time. I love retro jewel from the 40s. Mm -hmm. Really love 70s jewelry. Um, I love 70s jewelry that's informed by Art Deco carb stones. So it, I, I don't think I could, I honestly, I can't say. Is there a dream crown jewel you'd like to have? And this comes from uh, Tefgros Christo in Europe. A dream crown jewel. Um, I, the, the, probably the, um, the famous sapphire brooch of Queen Victoria mm. that, that Queen Elizabeth wears. Uh, it was a gift to her from Prince Albert. Mm -hmm. And I'm so, I love it so much. It's so simple and so classic. We actually have one, a 19th century brooch coming up that's very much like it, um, that we'll sell later this year. But I think that would be it. it. Because it was one of the first books that I ever bought was The Queen's Jewels. And I just remember looking at that brooch and reading the story and what a symbol of love it was between Prince Albert and Victoria. So I would say that. It's the story. It's so yeah. beautiful. Um, yeah. From Marina in our audience, if you could work in any other department at Sotheby's, what would you choose? Oh, uh, without question, photographs. It's a, a, a passion. Uh, many of the books on the shelf behind me are, are photography books. I have a big collection of Richard Avedon books in particular. Most of them are signed. It's taken me 30 years to collect them. Uh, so it would be photographs. And how many books do you estimate are in your library, if you don't know an exact number? I think I have about 600. Um, wow. Of, of these reference books. So the shelf that you've seen behind me, you've seen the full picture of it. Um, there's, another, there's another one in the next room exactly like it. Okay. And then there are two other smaller shelves. So I think there's, I think we, we catalog them all and keep track. And I think there's about 600 volumes. There's, that's amazing. And how many of those are jewelry books? It's pretty evenly weighed. I would probably say about 20%. It's like jewelry, fashion, photography, are interiors. So it's, it's pretty equal. Yes. Um, and what book is on your nightstand right now? Oh, I well, I just finished Ruth Reichel's um, latest book, Save Me the Plums, okay. uh, which was about her time as editor-in-chief at Gourmet Magazine, which I loved Gourmet and I miss it and I love Ruth Reichel. Yep. And uh, so now I just started reading something called Chanel's Riviera. I've just, oh, just yes. started it yesterday. And oh. um, it's, it's, Terrific. And it's not really a Chanel biography. It's yeah. just about the time when Chanel owned a house on the Riviera from 1930 to 1945. But yeah. it's about that world and all of those people. So it's just called Chanel's Riviera as, as the anchor, but it's, it's fantastic. So that's what I'm reading now. That's perfect. Okay, Frank, we're headed to the desert island now and you can bring three books to read. What would they be? Howard's End. Mm -hmm. Uh, which I could read over and over and over. Yeah. Um, honestly, it might be, I might take this one, The Cartier. Oh, we love that book. Right? Because yeah. it's so full of great information. Like, it's like you could read a little bit and put it down. And I think it's something, once you're finished with it, you could go back and start it again because you won't remember it all. Yeah. So I think um, that, those two, and then what would be a third? Um, not a jewelry book. Uh, I guess I would, um, there's a book called Their Eyes Were Watching God by mm -hmm. Zora Neale Hurston um, that is just a favorite that I've gone back to many times. It's a beautiful, beautiful, beautiful book. And um, yeah. so I, I might take that one, something that I would want to reread. Love that. And how about music? What are three songs you could listen to all day long? Well, <clears throat> I'm a Broadway show tune fanatic. So I could listen to the soundtrack to Chicago any day of the week. Um, I could listen to uh, 
Like, you or me? That's you. No, no, no. This is for you, Frank. Oh. Let's go back to your other question, but can you oh. see calling? Hi. Hi, Joanna. Oh, let me put her on speaker. Here we go. Now we can Hi. hear you. Hello, Lynn. Hello, Frank. Hi, how are you? Good. How are you? Okay. Good. Next question. If you could live anywhere in the world other than New York City, where would it be and why? Paris, of course. <laughs> <laughs> and I think you know why. Because it's got it, it's like it's like New York, but a different a different version of um, urban life, which is what what I am. It's ironic that I grew up on a farm, but I'm completely urban and all I wanna do is like go to the theater, go to the museums eat in restaurants, walk in the park, is plenty of nature for me, just a little walk on the river, walk in the park. Um, but I love Paris and um, I love it as much as New York, I think, so I, that's where. Perfection. Love that. And we're all going Thank on you. a field trip with Frank there when we can. Exactly. Uh, thanks, yeah. Joanna. Um, okay, so from Simon Teagle, Frank, oh. if you were wearing or if you weren't working in jewelry what industry would you be in Ooh, what would i do well i probably would have um i could have stayed in the restaurant business in some way i loved it and i did it in san francisco for a number of years but the way i was doing it really as a as an owner and a general manager i was on my feet all the time and it just you can't sustain that for your whole life so i really left the restaurant business because it was too taxing um, yeah. in terms of the physicality and, and you work you know seven days a week when you own a restaurant around the clock but i think if i hadn't done this i would have stayed in the food industry in some way and 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 gone into another branch of it is there a funny story that you might share with us from that part of your life in from my my restaurant days mm -hmm. funny i don't know about funny um i loved i mean i just i worked with um i will say i worked with two amazing women chefs in San Francisco. The first one was Joyce Goldstein. She had a restaurant called Square One. And then I worked for Nancy Oaks at Boulevard Restaurant, uh, which is still there. And Nancy's a dear friend. And I think, um, not a funny story, but I guess what, the, what I took away from it was um, when I got to San Francisco, I realized that the, the food and wine industry was such a respected profession there that it didn't have to be something you were doing while you were waiting to like write a novel or, get an acting job or whatever. It was like people were doing this because they wanted to do it. And then I, I, I of course did it because I wanted to do it. So it was really, it was the, in the eighties is when I think it became a real profession. Yeah. It's, do you miss living in San Francisco? I don't, I have to say, I don't miss it. Um, when I go back to visit, it doesn't, you know, when you leave a place, I think after about five years, it doesn't quite feel like home anymore. And to be honest with you, I didn't realize all, I lived there for 17 years. I didn't realize all those 17 years how much I hated the weather there. <laughs> mm, hear that, definitely. Ah. Frank, Although it looks just like San Francisco here today. I know, it was snowing here uh, like a few minutes ago. Yeah, it's just the weather is bananas. Um, Frank, what's the best gift you've ever received? Oh, the best gift. So, I mean, I've got, my husband is very creative. And he got me, uh, back to the books, he got me a first edition of Diana Vreeland's Allure mm. uh, signed, and then he made a beautiful box for it. He, he like custom made a beautiful wood box and lined it with red velvet because yeah. red was her signature thing. You know, everything had to be red. She loved red. We always loved that. So uh, I would say that's probably the most thoughtful and creative gift I've ever received. Mm. I also would say when I turned 40, my sister gave me a beautiful rose gold watch, a Bauman Mercier watch from 1940. Um, yeah. So I would say those two gifts are probably the, the most special things. That's so special. And Frank, what's the best gift you've ever given? I'm not a very good gift giver, actually. Um, I'm a good dinner party giver. So I've given some good dinner parties. <laughs> So I guess that's the that's, best, the, the best gift that I've ever received yeah, is to do for friends' birthdays or for my husband's birthday. Yeah. I do love to do like, a, a two, love like spend two days cooking, organizing, setting the table, every beautiful thing you can pull out of the cabinet and like all the stops. So I think that to me is the best gift I ever give. 
Love that. Um, is there a signature dish that you like to cook and prepare? No. Well, that's, th there is a dessert that I make often, this um, Meyer lemon buttermilk pudding cake with raspberries and whipped cream. It's actually something that I learned from Nancy Oaks at Boulevard and she still makes it. So that's kind of a signature dessert. Cheesecake is another thing that I love to make. Yeah. Um, so I would say those are probably my signatures. That's incredible. Frank, from the audience, is there any advice that you would give to someone trying to succeed in your business? Uh, read, 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 read. Get these books and read them cover to cover. You know, um, I was talking with Stelene Valandis from uh, Town & Country about jewelry books that can be read. Because, you know, people forget that it's more than just the pictures. Yeah. So you have some that are all pictures. Then you have some like the Cartier book I showed you, which is mostly text. It's really a, a history book. Mm -hmm. And I like the ones in between. And I think people miss out sometimes when they don't read every word in these beautiful books. So that's my advice. And Frank, did you have a mentor early in your career? I've had so many. Oh, my God. I've, I mean, if, if, I, if I lined them all up to say thank you, it would take me all day. I've yeah. been helped along the way every step by so many people from uh, I had a a professor in college, Joyce Henry, she's passed away. She was amazing and I lived with her for a year. Mm -hmm. Both Joyce Goldstein and Nancy Oaks in San Francisco here um, at Sotheby's. Yeah, I, I mean, there's so many. I, I've really been very lucky. That's amazing. Frank, do you have a style icon? Uh, no, I don't think I do because I think I've changed my style. I mean, for my personal style, I don't have a person that's an icon, but I do have brands that I aspire to, even if I can't afford to always buy them. Yeah. I love the look of Etro. Like whenever I see Etro ads, I want to be that person. Yeah. So <laughs> that's kind of a, a like an aspirational icon iconic yeah. look to me i just love that that mix of like classic with a twist on the color and yeah. the mix of pattern and that kind of thing so I, I guess that and we're down to the last 10 questions frank if you can oh um what is your favorite place to shop so i don't i get overwhelmed when i shop so i tend to like places that have smaller selections mm -hmm. um I, I was working with a guy at Bloomingdale's for years, but he left and um, went to Bergdorf's. So I can't afford to shop at Bergdorf's. <laughs> so yeah. uh, the last place that I felt really like that I enjoyed the process was at um, Todd Snyder, actually. Mm -hmm. I, I just, I felt like it was focused and there were a number of things that felt right to me, but I actually get, I can easily get overwhelmed shopping and then I just say, forget it, I can't buy anything. Mm -hmm. I, I, I don't like too many options. Yes. Frank, what was the most unexpected piece you've encountered in auction? And this comes from the audience. Unexpected. Oh. Well, I think I have to go back to the Marie Antoinette pieces. Yes. The, that, the, the, whole, the whole notion of that family collection yes. still being with that family. That, that to me was, was, I was shocked. When I heard the news of that from Geneva, I was just shocked. From Don in the audience, what jewel have you held in your hand that has brought tears to your eyes? Oh, tears. I would say um, the thing that brought tears, I, I inherited my grandmother's um, engagement ring, which was a beautiful Tiffany ring. Mm -hmm. um, not big, but from the, she got married in 1922. Mm -hmm. And I had that ring in my possession for many years. Mm -hmm. And I was living in San Francisco and I was, I was robbed. And uh, the ring was gone, of course. <clears throat> and I can't remember how long it took, but eventually I found the box. So they had, they had taken the ring and thrown the box on the floor. And I remember picking up that box, which I still have. It's in my bedroom right now. And I, of course, I cried. I looked at that. So I think that jewel to me was like something that had been left to me and, and, and trusted to me. It was like I felt really sad about that. It's so sad. Oh, well, I'm... There's nothing like a lost jewel. Um, like a lost jewel. Frank, if you could have any woman's jewelry collection from history, whose would you choose? Ellen Barkins. Mm, yes, jar. And I know, I know we didn't sell it, but I don't care. All that jar, come on. Frank, if you had a million dollars to invest in one thing right now, what would it be? Uh, a piece of Cartier Tutti Frutti. Anything. Ooh, that's awesome. Frank, what's your favorite app to use on your iPhone? My favorite app? Yes. Um, 
I'm going to tell you seriously, we have one, an internal app from Sotheby's called Sale Results, and oh. it's real time as sales, as auctions are happening in every category, you can keep up with the results. Yeah. And I really love, I love that app, and it's, it's not on my phone right now, and I really miss it. So when the auctions are happening, I can't just go and get that screenshot, that, yeah. that little snapshot look at the, at the auctions. And then Instagram. Love that. Um, do you have a favorite Instagram hashtag? Uh, the brooch is back. Of course. What are three must follow accounts on Instagram? Oh, three must follow accounts. That is really hard. I follow so many and we so all many. follow the same, the same jewelry ones. Um, I mean, I get the most joy, honestly, from some of the dog rescue ones like by the we and, and social teas. Um, yeah. when they, especially when they show you the success stories of a yeah. dog that rescued and then they do fast forward a year later and it's been placed in a home. So I think those are very um, meaningful to me. And, uh, and then things from friends, you know, like one that comes to mind, my friend uh, Rory uh, Travato, she has an ice cream business in California. And yeah. uh, I, that's how I stay in touch with her because I just watch her post. It's Rory's yeah. Creamery. And, oh. um, it's really just, she makes the best ice cream um, in the world. She's got several stores in California and I just love watching her and, and seeing what she's doing. So things like that. Yeah, that sounds fun. What is your favorite ice cream flavor? Uh, just plain vanilla. Yeah. I, I know, what can I tell you? And this is the last question. And we were hoping to just play a game of word association with you to end this interview. Are okay. You okay, ready? Vanilla floor. There's eight in all. Um, Elizabeth Taylor. Um, Bulgari. Mm, Marie Antoinette. Pearl. Cher. Fabulous. Devil Wears Prada. Um, uh, florals for spring. <laughs> Costume jewels. Uh, Kenny J. Lane. <laughs> Synthetic diamonds. Sad. Hope Diamond. I must go see it again. I've only seen it once and it was a long time ago. Yes, and last but not least, what did you think of this interview? It was great, it was fun. I, I didn't think you could do 73 questions in, in this time frame. Well, we got there. I'm happy to Excellent. say. Counter is at 73. And Frank, you've just been so wonderful to spend this Thanks. time with. We could sit here for hours and chat with you all. Everyone in the audience, we hope that you enjoyed it as much as we did. I hope so too. It was really, really good fun. I love doing it and keep, I'll, I'll keep watching for the ones that you do in the future because these are, um, they're really fun. They're informative. They're distracting at this time. And um, it's what we love to talk about, right? The great jewels and the great stories. Absolutely. And for everyone who isn't already, please follow Frank on Instagram. He's at Frank B. Everett. Um, and Heidi will be back with us on Wednesday interviewing the great jewelry historian Amanda Triosi on the jewels of the Italian Renaissance. So we're Fabulous. Really excited. Um, you can I'll be watching that. I love Amanda. Yes, we're so excited. Um, you can view our previous episodes on our website. And thank you again, Frank. This was so delightful. Thank you, everybody. Really enjoyed getting to know you. Have a great rest of your weekend. Thanks a lot. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.